good, everybody? It's your boy Tossman here once again alongside my chat team partner, Dale Clifford, out there in Friendly, Nevada. And welcome to yet another episode of No Gimmicks Podcast on the 3 and Out Radio Network. Dale, what is good, my man? Well, we're back to uh, you being in one place, me being another. Yeah, man. Unfortunately, we couldn't keep that whole thing going where we're out there in Nevada together. You know, I got business to handle out here in the East Coast, so... Hey, we'll try. I'll try not to stay away for almost uh, five years again. Let's put it that way, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. You've been missed out here. Anyway, so uh, after a slew of interviews, we get back to uh, some uh, wrestling action here, um, and we'll do a good, bad, ugly review of NXT Takeover Brooklyn Three. Yes, sir. Which ended with a trio mm-hmm. of. Uh, ROH stars coming together in a very nice way. Yes, uh, yes. Adam Cole, Bobby Fish, and Kyle O'Reilly. And obviously, we already had seen appearances from Kyle O'Reilly and Bobby Fish on NXT TV. So the big one was the NXT debut of Adam Cole, baby. Yes, sir. So for those of you who do not know, because a lot of people probably aren't aware Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly actually used to be in a tag team together known as Future Shock. So you kind of have a cross between Red Dragon and Future Shock together. And they teased this in ROH at one point in time. So I think it's kind of cool they went this route because the Kyle O'Reilly-Adam Cole feud I thought was a bit lackluster and really had an anticlimactic end to it. So let's go ahead and dive right into the good here of uh, Bobby Roode versus Drew McIntyre for the NXT uh, heavyweight title. For the good, basically, yeah, we had the uh, the appearance of the new heel stable uh, comprised of Cole and Red Dragon. So any uh, extra thoughts you'd like to add to that, Dale? No, I just also kind of thought the irony of, obviously, Adam Cole and Kyle O'Reilly in Ring of Honor being known as Future Shock and Drew McIntyre using a Future Shock DDT. Mm-hmm. I just kind of thought there was some symbolism there of Adam Cole's debut being – uh, on an attack against Drew McIntyre, but obviously yeah. with with the um, the way it ended with those three coming together and attacking Drew McIntyre being the good, that leads us into the bad of the yeah. lackluster main event yeah. and the fact that Bobby Roode's glorious title reign is now over, and now we're left to wonder where uh, he is headed. I believe he's not quite a main roster call up yet. I think he's got some unfinished business. Obviously, I think he's going to get a title shot again, or mm-hmm. he'll get his rematch with Drew, and we know that he's still got some unsettled uh, issues with uh, Roger Strong that I think got to be yes, a handle first. Yes, yeah, very personal business between those two. Um, shout out to my man Patrick Ketska. Him and I were having some uh, conversations about that on Facebook prior to um, our recording here of the No Games podcast. But, yeah, uh, Drew McIntyre came out to what I felt was a very cold reception from the NYC crowd, Um, you know, Root is always going to be over. He's always going to get the reaction with the glorious and all that stuff. But it just seemed like people didn't really seem to care about Drew McIntyre. And, I mean, even throughout the match and at the conclusion of the match, once he actually won the title before the trio from ROH, you know, showed up, it just seemed like it fell flat. You know, I think this was by far the most, um, you know, uninteresting, you know, match on the whole entire card, really, in all honesty here. Um, which really brings us to the ugly of this. Like I said, you know, Drew Galloway has done, or Drew McIntyre, I'm sorry, has done enough over his last couple of years to kind of separate himself from the um, the, com- the comedic trio that he was a part of known as the 3MB. Yet this guy is still getting 3MB chance throughout the, uh, the match here, you know, from the NYC crowd, even though he is now the NXT um, heavyweight champ. Dale, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, very surprised there because I thought um, he had done a very good job of his post WWE run, get going over to Evolve, going into Impact Wrestling, and reshaping himself as Drew Galloway to come back to WWE or the Drew McIntyre name again. But I still thought he had erased all of that stuff, and clearly tonight it seemed like uh, the Brooklyn crowd at least wasn't really ready to jur- jump on a. The Drew McIntyre bandwagon of the new redone Drew McIntyre, that is. No, no. So, I mean, yeah. So, hopefully, you know, this will uh, work out here for him and we'll get some good matches out of him. And um, it looks like it's going to be him versus Adam Cole coming up here in the near future. So, you know, we'll just have to see what the future has for us. Maybe some shots, perhaps. So, moving <laughs> on here. 
to the next match um, of NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3, we had Asuka, who now has the longest current winning streak in professional wrestling, taking on the challenger Ember Moon for the NXT Women's title. So the good here is the streak continues. She continues to be dominant, and no one can seem to knock her off. Dale, what's your thoughts on this? Yeah, I kind of think uh, that's where where it is. Obviously, you said the streak continues. Asuka remains um, unbeaten. But I also kind of feel like that leads us into a little bit too, as now it just seems like the NXT women's division has run its course. It's like it is tapped out of challengers. Mm-hmm. Who is next? I, yeah. There was one thing that I had kind of read that Triple H has really pushed very strongly to make sure that Asuka stays down in NXT right now because the division can sustain itself without her there. So mm-hmm. you can kind of see that this – I don't know when this train's now going to end because really there aren't women. Most of the strong women are on the main roster except for Asuka, who's now yeah. being – um the NXT women's division. So until the, the roster feels like it is strong enough to be without her, I don't know if it's going to be. Yeah, because I honestly thought the strongest competitor she had was the one who lost to her tonight, that being Ember Moon. You know, um, Patrick and I, once again, you know, shout out to him. We had this conversation prior to the show, and some of the names that were brought up were Nikki Cross, perhaps, or, you know, Ruby Wright or whatnot. And I honestly said I dig Nikki Cross's character I really do, you know, the crazy, just off the hinges character that she has. But is she championship material? Is she someone fit of dethroning Asuka of that winning streak? I don't believe so. Not right now, at least. You know, so, yeah, maybe someone from the uh, the Mae Young Classic will step up and be the one to do it. We'll just have to wait and see here. Um, So the ugly of this match, I thought was Ember Moon taking what looked like a, um, a hammerlock suplex onto the ram. Dale, you have anything to add to that? No, that's uh, definitely, I've uh, got to agree with you there. Anytime you kind of uh, get suplexes on the floor, on the ra- on the ramp, on the uh, side of the uh, apron, those typically kind of go as the ugly moves just because those are some of the harder bumps that you're going to take because it's you're, you're eliminating all aspects of what kind of makes it a safe there. Right, right, definitely. So now... <laughs> let's talk about making it safe. Let's talk about this match here that we had coming up next on the uh, NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3 card. We had the Dutch Destroyer, Aleister Black, taking on Hideo Yutami. Now, the good of this one was, man, this was just a relentless display of striking in this match. I mean, at times, this match almost somewhat resembled an MMA bout. These two guys beat the unholy hell out of one another. Dale, what's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, obviously, the good is that the strikes were pretty uh, rock solid in this one. And then obviously, though, is part of what became will become the ugly is the end result of what was Alistair uh, Black in this one. Um, but yeah, as you said, uh, these two obviously really well known for the strikes and the kicks, and they absolutely delivered the knee strikes in all of this. Obviously, Alistair... Black's finisher is the Black Mass, a spinning heel kick. So, and we know as like in and in, in Tommy's got the GTS, which ends in a knee strike. Mm-hmm. So, yep. And then obviously you had a uh, um, couple instances there, is like where um, Alistair's got it, um, getting kicked in the back by a Tommy, and those are some nice. Yeah. There. So, yeah. As you said, the good is that this one definitely delivered on on the strong strikes for sure. Yeah, he refers to that one, the kit to the back, as a spinal tap. And, yeah, I mean, those kits were coming in hard, man. He was laying them in there. So now the bad for this one is Hideo Yutami just cannot seem to capture any momentum. He's not really getting these wins that he needs to get on the pay-per-views especially. So uh, what's your thoughts on that? Right. We finally have a healthy Hideo Yutami, and he's now getting a good solid run of appearances on television and the – NXT pay-per-view events, but that's just things like he kind of now just seems like he's putting dudes over as mm-hmm. opposed to kind of being a guy that was being pushed when or when he first showed up it was he was going to be the um, Japanese market which has now been taken over by Shinsuke Nakamura because of the injuries to Atami and now it seems like Kadeo is kind of just lost in the shuffle 
yeah. as a guy to, to push because really WWE in the business aspect doesn't need him anymore like they did when they first signed him. He's been pushed to the back of the line. Not only has he been surpassed by Shinsuke Nakamura, but my man Tozawa as well has surpassed him. So, yeah, it's definitely him at the back of the line. So now for the ugly for this one, you kind of alluded to this not too long ago here. I said, hey, Alistair, <laughs> this was not an actual black mask, so that means you don't have to worry about drinking any blood. But he did when his nose got busted open uh, during the course of this match. Did you catch how that happened? Because I couldn't quite figure out. No, I, I missed it. I just uh, realized when uh, Tommy had him in a uh, headlock okay. that Alistair's nose was bleeding. And I'm like, oh, I think we kind of found the ugly again. Mm -hmm. One it's like one note that I think kind of needs to be mentioned is that with the recent string of some WWE stuff is you've been seeing a lot of um, bleeding the hard way going yeah. on lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of I, like, I think, it, <laughs> yep, is like, and I think it's kind of an aspect of WWE trying to get back to the proving there are real elements to professional wrestling. Yes, there are, as you and I know. Um, yeah, this was one of the first times that I can honestly say because I know I've stated this before in um, other episodes on No Gimmicks podcast that I haven't been a huge fan of Alistair Black utilizing the Black Mass as his finisher tonight. That kick was on point. I love the way he did it tonight, how he just kind of caught Hideo Yatami instead of doing the whole thing where he kind of scoops him up with his foot. Yeah, he landed that one square right in his jaw. So now, for the tag team titles, we had the Authors of Pain, the champions, facing off against the trio, or I guess you could say the foursome, known as Sanity. So the good of this one was, you know, the NST roster was about to learn the meaning of chasing the dragon because we had a little bit of a surprise at the conclusion of this match here and this was the initial showing up of um kyle o'reilly and bobby fish actually as the tag team of red dragon but also the authors of pain they were um defeated in this match by the pair of eric young and uh alexander wolf kelly and dane actually uh sat this one out here so dell what's your thoughts on all that it's very uh, interesting here that it seems like Adam Cole, Kyle O'Reilly, and Bobby Fish are all going to keep their names in NXT, mm -hmm. which uh, is one of those things because obviously you've got um, Alistair Black. He changed from Tommy End, and he even made a WWE appearance as Tommy End at the UK yes. tournament. All of the other name changes that we've we've seen, it just seems very surprising. It's like that WWE, it, it's kind of – weird how they decide which guys keep it which guys don't yeah i'm not sure what the determining factor in that is you know maybe it's one of those things where maybe they do like some sort of like a poll that they don't release to the public and they just randomly pull people and say hey how many of you know this guy by this name and if enough people answer say okay fine we'll keep them by their name but if not then they'll say all right sure we'll go ahead and we'll change it to something else because yeah i'm surprised about that as well you know tommy is probably no more over in europe I would say, and like maybe on the indie scene, but like some of these guys are actually getting exposure in Ring of Honor, which is, you know, shown on national markets, uh, TV, you know, but here in the United States. Like, um, but yeah, back to uh, this one is like, unlike the main event, is like, I felt like this was a good tag team match that really mm -hmm. could have had a, a good moment. But when you have the big moment of the reuniting of, on WWE television of, Red Dragon, it kind of steals the thunder from the match a little bit. and So I'm not quite sure if that's what w – I, I believe that's where WWE was going because obviously then you have them and, and Adam Cole ending the night together. So that mm -hmm. this was the big um, NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3 is going to be remembered for the arrival of yes. Kyle O'Reilly and Adam Cole. And then it's like – so now to the bad of this, I also just kind of felt like it was a weird – match to begin with because you have sanity who's kind of been working as the healist style character because right. really it's not one you're supposed to want to cheer for and then obviously aop has been bruisers forever but since all of the recent personal issues that eric young has gone through it felt like sanity was gaining crowd support yeah yeah everybody was wanting eric young to get a championship because you kind of just felt like he needed it for all of the personal issues that he he uh, just is now coming back to uh, WWE for. Yeah, Eric Young lost his mother not too long ago, so our thoughts and prayers go out to him. But yeah, um, it's interesting that you that you bring that up here because 
this just really came out of nowhere because Sanity was looking kind of weak not too long ago. I swore that if anyone was going to knock the tag team of the Authors of Pain off, it was going to be Heavy Machinery because I said they're built you know, physically to match up well against the Authors of Pain, but they just completely deviated away from that. And they said, okay, sure. You know, we're going to go down a completely different, you know, road here altogether. And we're going to have the, uh, have the trio of uh, Sanity pretty much go up against Authors of Pain. Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, the bad of this one here is this most likely was the end of the Authors of Pain in NXT because there's not really much else for them to do. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they fare on the main roster, whether they wind up on Raw or SmackDown. Not sure yet, you know, which one makes more sense. But uh, what's what's your thoughts on all that, Dale? So here's the thing. It's like we're still awaiting the team that has attacked Brizongo. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. They, and we speculated that it was AOP, and it just didn't make any sense because they were still ta NXT Tag Team Champions, and you're like, there's no way that they're going to move while right. being champions. Well, guess what? They ain't the champions now. Yeah. And yeah. we've got a couple weeks. It was like, and it was a two weeks is like, was the return of Breeze on was like, so we're not getting the, it was like, we might get something, but mm -hmm. WWE SmackDown teased that it was still going to be two more weeks before we resolved this in a resolution at SummerSlam. Mm -hmm. I still feel like we could very much put the money on that. It is authors of pain and they're coming to SmackDown. They make more sense than uh, than Rowan and Harper, I think, personally. Yeah, that's a very good point. So, yeah, that very well could be where they end up here. So now getting to the ugly of this match, my goodness. <laughs> Nikki Cross was a part of a sandwich, okay, between Rezar from the Authors of Pain and Killian Dane from Sandy and a table. That was just a brutal spot, man. I just said to myself, I said, she's brave. I give her props for taking that spot. Dale, what else you have to say about that, man? Yeah, that's the one thing is like I'll say is um, she has lived up to kind of the the toughness of this group sanity. It's like they're supposed to be rugged and all of that things. Like and some of the things that she's done is like you've seen her do numerous table spots in the women's matches before. This is a big one too. It's like to to be in the middle of two. 300 plus pound men as they come mm -hmm. slamming together to go through a table on yeah. like on the barricade so definitely uh props to uh her for just kind of stepping up and um being one of the few women that is doing some big time spots yeah yeah props props all the way to nikki cross for that like i said i think women's title you know wordy at some point just not right now um moving on here to the opener from um nsc takeover brooklyn three we had Johnny Wrestling, a.k.a. Johnny Gargano, taking on Andrade Cien Amos. So now, the good in this one was, this was definitely the right choice to open this pay-per-view. The crowd was hot for this match. It was a very compelling matchup, displaying, you know, the talents and the movesets of both guys involved. Dale, do you agree with that? Absolutely. And Gargano is very much over with... Uh, the continued NXT crowd. Um, as this one was going on, I was starting to just kind of think, though, this momentum to the main roster because we've seen huge pops for NXT guys, and then they get to the main roster, and WWE just plugs them in somewhere, and it doesn't work. And you kind yeah. of look at Johnny Gargano, and you're like, he's cruiserweight divisions are like written all over him, and mm -hmm. you're like, it's going to be a disaster for him. Right, Because right. WWE does not do the uh, 205 Live, the Cruiserweight Division, any justice. The pay-per-views come around. It's on the kickoff show pretty much every time. Mm -hmm. So, but going back to this match, absolutely thought this was the perfect uh, way to uh, start um, NXT TakeOver Brooklyn 3. And you really got a chance to um, see Andrade um, showcase his stuff. I absolutely loved when uh, Gargano was going for that powerbomb off the top rope. Mm -hmm. He was like the sunset power bomb, and um, Andrade flipped it into a moonsault. Yeah, yeah, beautiful, beautiful execution right there. Yeah, and then they went into a sequence of uh, back and forth uh, moves there. They definitely uh, showed some good chemistry there, and it was also nice to kind of like for the length of time he's been there, you kind of look at both these guys. You're like Gargano, you know, is over. I don't think the loss hurts him, but a loss for 
um, Andrade, I think, would have hurt there. So it was nice to kind of see him get the win. And it feels like now that he's added the valet, he's going to finally get maybe yeah. back. That's that's basically, you know, the bad of what we have here for this one. You know, um, both need to win, but one of them had to take the L. Now, the one thing I must say is, yes, the, um, the addition of Zelina Vega, who is, um, I want to say, Austin Aries' is, uh, girlfriend or fiance, I believe. I think that's who she was. She was uh, in Impact Wrestling at one point in time as Rosita. Um, that's the same person there that I think that he has accompanying him to the ring. Yeah, the addition of her to his side, I think that's um, going to give him some momentum, you know, also, um, you know, work with him as a heel and whatnot. Because I like the distraction that she uh, provided tonight by handing the, uh, what was it, a DIY shirt? I yep. think it was the Gargano to kind of, you know, throw him off guard while he was able to attack him, you know, and whatnot and apply the, uh, the hammer lot DDT. Yeah, that was good stuff there. So, yeah, um, you know, I think Gargano would definitely be able to pick up some wins along the way. But um, I think, you know, this one tonight, this definitely gives Andrade C and almost some much needed momentum that he needed. So let's move to the ugly of this one here. We had Gargano who just completely took C and almost and did almost similar to what Kevin Nash um, did to Rey Mysterio years ago. I think it was um, when they were the NWO and he launched him into the side of the trailer, lawn dart style. So playing the, the role of the lawn dart was on Trudy Singham almost as he went head first right into the middle turnbuckle. Dale, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? I also uh, just thought it was like the ugly two could have been um, Andrade's chest from all the chops from Gargano. Ooh, yeah. yeah, he got lit up pretty good in this one. Yeah, you definitely uh, saw some of that, and and that was like with the C C M L L Mexican styles, like it would be a little bit more luchador art style type mm -hmm. stuff. And obviously, we know we've seen plenty enough of what Johnny Gargano can do. So uh, good showcase there, and and definitely he that lawn dart move is in Gargano's move set. So we've seen that before, but definitely we we know the uh, the rigors of a. Uh, doing the chops and uh, you kind of uh, save the big chops for the big moments. And that was yes. a, a match like this. You yeah. kind of, you kind of don't, you, you don't do those at house shows. You don't do those uh, in any of the other type of things. Like you save the big chops for the big moments as we've learned. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we have. Yeah. That man took a lick and he kept on ticking though. I must say that. So now time for your favorite part of the show here, Dale Me. on the no given scale from one to five. What do you give an NC takeover Brooklyn three? I'll just keep it at uh, it's a takeover Brooklyn three. I'll I'll give it with a three. We'll just stick right there. It's like it wasn't uh, it wasn't terrible. Um, yeah, three seems to kind of be right in in the just for this one. Okay, I'm gonna give it a four because in all honesty, I thought it was a solid show from top to bottom. There was not one bad match on that entire show. The only match, like I said, that I thought was lackluster and somewhat boring, ironically, was the main event. But the finish with the trio from ROH with Cole and uh, Fish and O'Reilly showing up, that saved it for me. So, yeah, so just overall pretty solid show from top to bottom and one of their better efforts recently in the, uh, the TakeOver series. So, of course, we look forward to uh, SummerSlam tomorrow night and see how that compares to this show. But, uh Thank you for joining us for this edition of the No Gimmicks Podcast. This has been our Good, the Bad, and the Ugly of NST TakeOver Brooklyn 3. We are No Gimmicks, No Image, all wrestling, all the time. Please subscribe to our official YouTube channel at www.youtube.com forward slash the No Gimmicks Podcast. Make sure that you subscribe publicly so that way we are aware of your support. Also, check out Craig Perkins' article, Around the Ring and Back Again, on ProWrestling.com. We would like to hear from our viewers, so please leave us some feedback in our comment section. Also, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at the No Gimmicks PC. Remember, sharing is caring. Feel free to share the links to our episodes with other professional wrestling fans and on your social media accounts as well. That does it for this episode of No Gimmicks Podcast on the 3 and Out Radio Network. From my tag team partner, Dale Clifford in Fernley, Nevada, this is Todd Smith in Bristol, Connecticut, signing off. Until next time around... Y'all take care.